that this legislation, the effort to further disseminate information on Megan's Law offenders, would run into a constitutional prohibition. Even the governor says it would be unconstitutional to post the names of sex offenders on the internet. But she says, change the constitution. The conflict over Megan's Law in cyberspace, it's what's on the docket for this week's due process. Major funding for due process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. Jersey's Megan's Law. It survived years of legal challenge and launched a nationwide movement. But just when it seemed that the controversy was over, that Megan's Law was a fact of our criminal justice scene, a new e-twist has put Megan's Law back in the headlines. Sandy King is here to explain. Raymond, the plan that's put Megan's Law back on the front page would put sex offenders post-release on a web page, an official state web page with name, address, photo, and even a prediction of the likelihood he'll strike again. It's a plan that surfaced at the highest state levels at a time, ironically, that the state and the courts were still locked in a struggle to keep Megan's Law info confidential, a struggle that will likely lose all meaning if that info finds a very public home on the Internet. How can you look at me like that? It's never going to be kept a secret, even though it says it will be. We first met this convicted sex offender four years ago. His fear back then that he'd be disgraced and damaged by the new legislation known as Megan's Law. I just don't think it's fair to a lot of people. Today, he says he's too afraid to talk to us at all, with the impact of Megan's Law about to be electronically stepped up. When you're marked with a scarlet letter, your entire community knows that you're a former offender, you fear vigilantism, and you're trying to move forward with your life, it's very difficult to establish that stability and move forward as a law-abiding citizen. But Megan's law so far has survived its court challenges. We've been through this. We know, we've had the test. We've been through the courts. The courts have agreed with us that the public does have a right to know. And the idea that began right here in New Jersey with the shocking murder rape of a seven-year-old girl by an ex-con neighbor with a violent, hidden history as a sexual predator has now led to Megan's laws in all 50 states. Because we feel it's important to ensure that we have the maximum amount of information for people in order to ensure safety of communities. Lock them up and throw away the key. But it, they're not doing that. So if they're not going to do that, at least let us know who they are so we can watch them. And the way it's worked so far, once a sex offender's been released, set and served, He's classified Tier 1, 2, or 3, depending on how great a risk he is thought to still present. What the New Jersey Supreme Court said in Doe versus Poritz is that only those, quote, likely to encounter, close quotes, the offender are entitled to that information, even at the highest tier. But all that will change if the governor and the legislature have their way. Their plan to follow the lead of 15 other states by taking those confidential records now confined to those likely to encounter and putting them on the internet for everyone to see. I'm afraid that these notification policies will push offenders underground and make them more likely to offend as a result of that. Christy Whitman does not possess the authority as governor or as a private citizen to repeal what the Supreme Court has written. And the governor knows this may be thin legal ice. So she's come up with what she insists will be a legal remedy. We feel that this legislation, the effort to further disseminate information on Megan's Law offenders, would run into a constitutional prohibition. And therefore, there's a need to change the Constitution. I see the second that would require, first, approval by the legislature, something almost guaranteed. Uh, the Senate's very 
very supportive of what the governor has suggested happen, that is amend the Constitution. And next, approval by the voters in a test that could come in November. But I mean, we represent people. They're demanding that we take action in this area. They're demanding that they have the, the greatest sense of uh, security in this area, and uh, we want to provide that. The legislature has been with us on this, and I know there are strong feelings there to ensure that we give the citizens in our communities the tools that they need to ensure their own safety. That tool would mean that a John Doe like feel, this one, whom we met two that. years ago when a neighbor leaked this confidential communication to a local paper, would have his name, face, address, and more on an official state website like this one from Florida. As for our initial John Doe interview, he had been convicted of molesting two little boys. Still, his designation was and is Tier 1. Till now, that meant only confidential registry with local police, but no community notification. The Internet plan would change that, too. Tier 1 also has a name search. It, it wouldn't automatically put those Tier 1 individuals on the Internet, but there'd be a name search uh, requirement. There is a 14th Amendment due process right to privacy. You are entitled to due process under the law. You're entitled to some protection of your reputation. You cannot be publicly branded, at least not since the Salem witch trials were dispensed with, and placed in the stocks in a public square. I hate to think that the governor would consider amending our most precious document in this state in order to get around, quote, rulings that are based on sound constitutional policy. And the question of constitutionality is still far from settled. An amendment to the state constitution may resolve the issue in New Jersey courts, but some experts say there will still be federal questions to resolve, and Raymond federal challenges still sure to come. And the possibility of the challenge is just one of the questions we'll take up with the former congressman who sponsored the federal Megan's Law, with a law professor legislator who says he's not yet decided how he'll vote on this one, and to a criminal defense attorney who insists that constitutionally, Megan's Law is out of line and about to get worse, so stay with us. to eliminate sex offenders is a great idea, however we do it. He did the lowest crime that a person could make. Post them on the internet, that way everybody has access to them. To put them on the internet denies that person a chance to redo his life and, and remake it into something good. Yeah, I think they should be posted all over. So it won't c continue to happen to kids all over the world. I think we need to do whatever is necessary to protect children. If we can't protect them, we've got nothing and we've got no existence. I believe that when a man has paid his debt to society, no matter how terrible the crime may be, uh, that's what it's all about. You paid your debt and, uh, you know, you have a right to uh, get on with your life. Granted, ours was a decidedly unscientific survey, but it might be worthwhile to note that it was a lot easier finding people who supported Megan's Law on the Internet than those who opposed the idea. But we'll hear from all sides here. From a believer, former Congressman Dick Zimmer. From a detractor, criminal defense lawyer Kathy Walden. And from a so far undecided assemblyman and Seton Hall law professor Wilfredo Caraballo. Welcome to you all. Congressman, let me start with you because this is legislation that you've been connected with from the beginning. And you know very well that it has taken a long time to go through the state courts and the federal courts. And even now, there's been subtle adjustments still being made to try to protect all the constitutional interests involved. Why, then, is this an appropriate time for a state constitutional amendment? Well, New Jersey was one of the first states to enact the Megan's Law, and that's appropriate because Megan Kanker was murdered here in New Jersey. But many states, 19 by the latest count, have now made this information about sexual predators available to the general public over the Internet. It's an, an essential way to make sure that people who need this information will get it. And New Jersey is now behind the wave rather than ahead of it. But both our state 
because a state Supreme Court and at least a couple of federal district court judges said, look, there are problems. You can't just put everything out there. There are severe limitations. And this amendment seems to want to override some very reasoned judgments that have been made about an area of the law that has some complexity and interests on both sides. Well, uh, there is a balance always to be made, and I believe that uh, the detractors of Megan's Law predicted that we were going to have uh, the original version just thrown out as unconstitutional. But the federal courts and the state courts recognize that the right of the public to protect itself outweighs uh, the rights of convicted sexual predators. In this case, we do have a restricted interpretation of our law by our state Supreme Court, which uh, probably has to be superseded by a state constitutional amendment. At the federal level, I'm confident that the U.S. Supreme Court will uphold uh, in a, uh, this version of Megan's Law under the federal constitution, even if our Court of Appeals, the Third Circuit the Court of Appeals, does not. The U.S. Supreme Court recently declined to hear an appeal of a decision by another Court of Appeals which upheld Tennessee's law, which includes Internet notification. But that's just a decision not to decide, and we're going to have correct. a chance to test your prediction as we have in the past. Kathy Walter, I prefer to call you a critic rather than a detractor. I think it puts a better gloss on it. But nonetheless, you do have some caveats and criticisms of this constitutional amendment. What are they? I, I can't imagine, uh, and I think it's a political football, if you will. It's an election year ploy. Let's amend the Constitution. Forget we have a judiciary. Let's amend it so that we can make this rule, this new rule, let these people be on the Internet. And what happens, Raymond, when the Internet changes? Do we reamend the Constitution to fit the changing Internet, the growing Internet? I mean, forget the privacy interests for now. Why misuse our Constitution to make a niche so politicians can win a happy issue for themselves? Well, nobody who votes on this issue is going to be saying or thinking that they're in favor of sexual assaults. So what are the reasons to say, no, you shouldn't put all the information about everybody convicted under these statutes out on the Internet? There are privacy issues. I, I, I'm not saying that there are people that shouldn't, in fact, be exposed on some level. We have Megan's Law. So far, it's working okay, as interpreted by the judiciary. And I'm not necessarily in favor of it as it is. But once you have the Internet, you have a very small number of people that actually know how to use the Internet as it is. and. Uh, I think it's information that will be misused, promote vigilantism, and clearly promote all kinds of verbal attacks on people that have some issue, some interest in privacy, whether or not they're level one, level two, or level three, the most severe to the slightest in, in terms of the tier arrangement. And we should point out that the levels have to do with how much information is given out. We'll talk about that in a little while. But first, let me ask Assemblyman Carabayo, who's also Professor Carabayo, uh, what about the Assembly, which passed this amendment when it first came before it, and the fact that you and several Democratic colleagues abstained? Why did you abstain? Oh, uh, we were being asked uh, to, to vote for a law which is clearly unconstitutional. And, and to me, truthfully, it was almost insulting that... Why abstain that rather than vote no, then? Well, you know, because uh, to me, and, and as I indicated at the time, it was a question of really saying, you know, I really didn't even want to participate in this. You, the sponsor, know that in fact this is unconstitutional, uh, and yet you're forcing us to deal with this because you've got a political agenda that you want to make. I refuse to be a part of that political agenda. Let me ask you about the cynical take on the abstention of 15 Democrats. And the cynical take is that this is a very politically popular bill, but that there are some Democrats who have constitutional reservations but don't want to take the political hit for standing on their constitutional beliefs. Is that fair at all in any case, or is that just you know, wild uh, speculation? I, I've, I've learned to, to accept that anything is fair as far as politics is concerned because uh, uh, that's the way it is. I mean, people are going to characterize it any way they choose. I, I just like to think that the people uh, who, who know my voting record, and the voting record of the vast majority of those 15, by the way, know that the one thing we are not is, is political cowards. And we, we've spoken our minds on this issue. We've, we've uh, voted on other issues which were uh, probably as politically uh, tinged uh, as this one. Uh, this was a protest vote by many of us. Um, and, but if it's characterized as cowardice because of politics, I mean, I really, to be honest, well, don't care. Let me ask you this. Assuming that this matter is voted on and is a favorable response for the sponsors in the Senate, and there's ultimately a vote by the people. Will we see those Democrats and others 
publicly opposing this bill and no. arguing these constitutional questions? No, no, we, we have two different issues, mm -hmm. uh, Ray. Mm -hmm. the, the, the vote we took mm -hmm. was on a bill mm -hmm. that would put this information on the internet now, right. not a constitutional right. amendment. The issue of whether or not those same 15 will do the same thing on the constitutional amendment is different. I, for one, for example, mm -hmm. am at this point uh, unsure as to which way to go. Very different from my what has you uncertain? Previous legislation. Usually you're pretty confident. What has you uncertain on this? Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, you talk about privacy issues, and I, and I understand that. I mean, I've, I have fought very hard uh, most of my adult life for, for due process and, and, and issues involving the, the rights and freedoms of, of individuals. I, I find that this is one of those situations where we have a genuine balancing test that has to be undertaken uh, as to whether or not these privacy issues outweigh the right to know. And, and it seems to me that we're dealing, you know, the, one of your individuals, uh, one of the people you interviewed previously said that when a man serves his sentence, that should be it. Well, the fact of the matter is we, the people, can determine what that sentence is. And in fact, we do so in every crime. Consequently, if we determine as a public policy matter that part of this sentence that we want to impose on these individuals because of the heinous nature of this particular crime is to make your name public, then we have the right to do that. So to me, it's not as simple as saying, well, somebody's paid his debt, or not as simple as, as, as saying there are no rights to be considered. There are rights on both sides, and to me, this is, this is one of those. I, I've never had as difficult a time in four and a half years now as a legislator uh, with an issue as I'm having with this one. Congressman, let me put some teeth in the privacy concept, because that sounds kind of abstract. One of the things that our state Supreme Court wrestled with when it first said we're going to permit notification was to say we're going to have some restrictions on notification. We insist that there be these tiers and also that only those who may be affected know. And since oh, then, they've right. been They're likely to encounter. Right. Those are people who, and they've also, we've had subsequent restrictions required by a federal district court in terms of ensuring that people who do get notification don't pass it on. All of that, a recognition of the fact that this whole and this whole structure only works if we can protect people from vigilantism or from excessive response. If you put it all on the Internet, you really throw all of those protections out the window. So when we talk about privacy, we're not talking just about an abstract concept. We're talking about people who have, in some states, faced real harassment, real attacks, and real assaults, not necessarily physical, from other citizens. Is that something that we just throw out the window now when we deal with the Internet? Well, the issue of vigilantism, I think, has been way overblown. We have Megan's Laws in all 50 states. We have Internet coverage in 19. And there's very, very little vigilantism. But every, court, but every court that's dealt with this and has it's said, something to be but that's concerned built, but, but about. Built, but the reason is that by having a tiered system and by having restrictions... But these other the states don't have it, and they don't have uh, vigilantism. I, I, I take detail. exception with that. Uh, I don't know that 19 states do. As of yesterday, on my Internet, four states, in fact, had uh, notification through Internet systems. Two of the states uh, were Texas and, and Virginia, which were traditionally very conservative states. Uh, but besides... But there's an umbrella site which can give you all of the states, and it's far more than four. But, let me ask but, you but, this, but it's me, on different let me, levels. Let me come back to New Jersey just for a second. The argument in New Jersey has been, since we want to make sure there is no vigilantism, because the state's duty is as much to protect these very unpopular and disliked con convicted people as others, is that we will say... Only certain people should get the information, and when they get it, they can only use it in certain ways. Right. And, and I've been a, a long I say that the balance has been struck too far in the direction. But is there any balance at all you would strike? How would you strike any balance once you put all the information as to the top two tiers on the Internet and make it possible to type in a name and get the third? Where's the balance? Well, I think that the balance should be as, as, uh, as close to the uh, public uh, availability as possible. Uh, the fact is that all the predictions that were made five years ago about the terrible things that would happen with Megan's Law have generally not come to pass. And the fact is that, that parents who need to know whether their children's uh, uh, little league coach ha is a sexual predator or people who want to buy a home in a neighborhood and want to know whether there's, they're going to be moving next door to a predator, Pe people who, whose children uh, go to a school uh, that may be in the neighborhood where a predator uh, lives or, uh, or frequents, they don't have that right. And the standard in the federal law that I sponsored was that it would be disclosed as necessary to protect the public. That's a broader standard than likely to encounter. And I think that 
parents have a right to have that information under those circumstances. You may have some voyeurs. I mean, you can, you, Alaska is one of the states that, that is up well, on so the why web. Not change and the standard. I can find out about predators in Alaska. Uh, not that I care to, not that I would harass them. But why should I know about predators in Alaska or Delaware or several other Kathy states? Kathy has a good question. Why, why not change the not standard the legislatively, then avoid the judiciary, the appointed judiciary. The governor appoints judges it's, and the Supreme Court. It seems to me we ought to have faith in our judiciary. We pay them an awful lot of money. To, to take out, carry out legislation and to appropriately make decisions. If we wanted to amend the Constitution every time we didn't like a court decision, what a, a silly thing our Constitution well, would be. Well, our Constitution has been amended dozens of times since it was first adopted on major in 1947. Issues, not on creating major insidious it was, classes. It was, it was current. Taxes. On, on something taxes, important. on gambling, on all kinds of minor things where the Constitution is specific. The, the, this is government belongs to the public. Amending the Constitution is, is fairly difficult to do. You require super majorities of the legislature, you require a public referendum, but ultimately this state and its government belongs to the public. And if the public believes that the, that the Supreme Court has, has been wrong in its interpretation of the Constitution, and there's no specific language in the Constitution that provides for this protection for these predators, okay. it's, the, it's the right of the people to let me see if I can give They let do whatever Let me see if I can give the Assemblyman another chance to uh, tell us what it is in terms of the constitutional issues that most troubles you. Yeah, uh, you know, first of all, I disagree with what uh, the good gentleman has just said. It's not that, that we're talking about the idea that they have interpreted the Constitution incorrectly. In fact, the, the uh, state Supreme Court, I think, has very correctly interpreted the Constitution in light of Megan's Law. Uh, the question for us is, do we want to take it a step further? Uh, and that is what presents us with, with the clash of, of constitutional rights. We have, as a, as a society, the right to amend the Constitution in this area. Uh, Kathy, I understand what you're saying about uh, the gravity of this issue, but it seems to me that it is the gravity of this issue which makes it amenable for this kind uh, of amendment. Now, Professor whether Gale, we should do this as a public policy, that's a different issue. And that's Professor Gale, that Gale, you, you have wear two hats. One is obviously as an assemblyman where policy is your first consideration, although you're obviously concerned about the Constitution. But as a professor, I mean, there are double jeopardy and ex post facto arguments that have been raised as constitutional barriers depending on how you structure this. Yeah, Do those initial, trouble you at all? And if so, initial, how are you going to resolve that as you decide where your position is going to yeah, be? Yeah, the initial making of law, I thought, uh, actually was flawed because it had ex post facto uh, aspects to it. But if we assume that this is only, only going to be prospective, I, I don't think there are any constitutional barriers uh, that, that we would that, that would, in fact, uh, restrict the right of the people to change the Constitution in this yeah. one area. I, I, don't, I don't see any, any barriers. Let me give Kathy Walder a chance to convince one of her public servants that he should vote her way. Go ahead, Kathy. Convince I, someone. I, I, I have to say that using the Constitution to get something done that is so far unconstitutional it is appalling to me. It means why not use the Constitution every time the judici judiciary, excuse me, makes a decision we don't like, the legislature. And to say that the voters have an interest, I don't say they don't. Let them make the sentences life sentences. Let the legislature raise the sentences rather than amending the Constitution every time there's a political problem with the judiciary. This isn't a question of a political problem. I, I mean, I don't see this. As a question of I'm a the only one problem. here not running for it's office. Not a well, but I'm, I'm not running this year. This is not an election year for me. And you are an you, assemblyman. Yeah, but this is not an election year. Let me so you don't think this is a touchy, a difficult political vote to oppose this legislation? Oh, it absolutely is because it means you have to do a lot more explaining if you vote no than you would if you voted yes. But that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of us who are willing to look at this on its merits for policy and determine which is the right way to go and then be able to defend it to our constituencies. I'm not afraid of my constituency on this issue at all. I am afraid to make for one thing, and that's my own conscience on this issue. It's not about President politics. It's not President about Zimmer wants to persuade you in 10 I, seconds. No, I just wanted to defend the assemblyman. I think that he's acting the way that the public officials should. You obviously have deep concerns. You have a lot of knowledge about this issue. Uh, and you we're going to right thing by come back lives. and find out what Assemblyman <laughs> Caraballo does, how the congressman's predictions work out, and whether Kathy remains a critic of this important.
piece of legislation and constitutional debate. That's it for this edition of Due Process, but there's too much more to say on this question to let it drop here. So we'll be back next week, not to just talk about Megan's Law, but to examine the underlying issues and how we handle the problem of sex offenders, how we catch them, how we jail them, and how once they're released, we treat them in a whole different set of ways. So we'll hope you'll join us next week. Till then, for Sandy Kay and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, 